Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, episode 641. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 19th, 2021. All uh, right, campers. Well, I guess I'm the only camper on the program. Uh, we're back here in Florida, set up at the Florida Grand RV Village uh, outside of Webster, Florida. That is the middle of nowhere, Florida. And uh, before we get too far into the program, I do want you guys to donate. We don't need money. Well, we do. We need your likes. Uh, we really are, are fighting up against the algorithms of YouTube and Facebook. Uh, and free advertising is when you like the program, they promote the program. And in this day when the conservative voice, the orthodox voice is being shut down, we really ask that you would take the extra time and click like either on Facebook or YouTube. Please continue the comments in the comment section. It's awesome to read your comments. George and I read every comment and we do respond to as many as we can. And what else? Do, oh, share the program. If you love Anglican Unscripted, you probably love enough to share. So please share it on Facebook, share it on YouTube, send the email to friends or foes as you wish. Um, and for those of you who watch the program and you've not subscribed yet, I, I, I don't know what to say. It's a little red rectangle. You click it, there's a bell, you click the bell, you are subscribed and you will receive instant notifications every time I upload an episode. George, how's it going in Florida, I would say, but I'm in Florida. It's cold, really cold. It was 30 degrees this morning. <laughs> it's great. Uh, this COVID time has given me the opportunity to do the sorts of things that I want to do steam clean the carpets in the parish hall <laughs> getting seven-year-old gravy stains coffee stains s maple syrup stains from shrove tuesday pancake dinners cabbage juice stains from saint patrick's day dinners oh man it's just the joy to see the filth lifted out of the carpets i i gotta tell you, it's I, I have to admit we've got a carpet cleaning machine the regular rug doctor things but I went and I rented one of these uh, circular scrubbing floor things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, power tools make me happy. Yes, Kevin, <laughs> if you want to make me happy, don't send me money. Send me a power tool. <laughs> and, oh, I've just been having a ball using this power tool. I, I did the carpets in my car with it, too. Oh, it's so much fun. <laughs> well, it's good to have a clean church. And uh, now... COVID times have really allowed uh, the infrastructure to be upgraded. Uh, back when we lived in Milford, they said, listen, nobody's on the roads. Let's tear them all up and repay them for once. And so by the time we got back up to uh, uh, Connecticut last month, there were no more potholes and everything had been repaved. Still, they left the cones up. They like to have the orange cones up because they want to represent not just Christmas season, but construction season. Uh, and we're seeing that throughout my whole drive down. There's uh, new construction, pothole filling, and people are using COVID uh, to help update the infrastructure from what I can see. So uh, we did the same at our church, some things here and there. So I'm glad to see that that's happening. Um, let's see, we're going to hit the news or we're going to talk. Some people complain because we talk about real life issues uh 20 minutes into the program we're only five minutes in now and i thought you know we, we could move to the news sooner because there is uh four or five news stories most of them from africa the biggest one is archbishop a former archbishop well, let's of, do let's oh yeah let's do the the smallest one because they're all tied in many ways they are smallest in the sense of not well each story is important but the first woman bishop in africa Elena Wamukola, let me make sure I'm not mangling her last name. Uh, Elena Wamukoya, that's it. Bishop of Swaziland, died this morning from COVID-19. Uh, we put out a little uh, thing on Anglican Inc. early in the week, asking for prayers and letting people know that she was ill. And today uh, I got an email from Archbishop Tabo Makoba of Cape Town, uh, I and all other people on his list saying that she had passed away after being an in intensive oxygen therapy. So COVID, evidently there's a South African strain that's a new one that is becoming pretty virulent among uh, people our age. Sure. And uh, it carried off the Bishop of Swaziland. Yeah, it's sad to read that. I mean, uh, we 
we're very news centric to what's happening here in America with COVID. And then we, we see what's happening in, uh, in Europe and other places. Uh, and as long as they're doing worse than us, we don't care so much. Uh, but to see it happen in Africa and uh, places where there isn't the transportation uh, quotient that we have here in America, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard, especially when it's the Anglican Church. And, you know, as you said, Kevin, the varieties of the illness, uh, we had a, a, an outbreak in our church where on Friday I learned four people had tested positive for COVID. And uh, two of the four I had visited in their home, and I, we had a pastoral team helping them during the week. So all of us uh, were tested. Um, we got the results on Monday, and two of the five people who from our parish picked up the COVID virus. None of us, including the original two, have any major symptoms other than a scratchy, sore throat and unable to smell. I'm perfectly fine. Uh, but, you know, so we have people going into a two-week lockdown who basically are more irritated because uh, they can't do anything, but they got full, blo they have COVID. That's so it, it's a funny, it's a funny illness uh, and that or funny virus where it's taking people in the prime of life uh, or people yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think you mean here. to say funny. It's a strange, hard to understand, even at the scientific level, virus, because it is so darn contagious. Uh, mm -hmm. By wearing masks, we have wiped out the flu. There's no flu strain one or flu, uh, strain two this year. A, a and B stro strains of flu are gone. The common cold has been wiped out except for people who have small kids who go to school. Um, so the mask has worked to take care of those diseases, but it, as far as we can tell, it has not ebbed the massive infection rate of COVID. And it's just, it's strange. So, well, this is, provides a little segue into our second story, which is the election of a woman bishop in Kenya. Now, if, bishop, if the Bishop of Swaziland had not passed away, there would now be four African Anglican women bishops. There, are two in, there were two in South Africa, now there's only one. There's one in South Sudan, Elizabeth, I forget her last name, I'm sorry. Right. She's an assistant bishop of Boer. And this past week, the Bishop of Bondo in uh, Kenya announced that uh, the, the Dean of Students at St. Paul's Theological College in Limuru, Elizabeth Oyango, had been appointed by him as the assistant bishop of Bondo. And this caused a bit of excitement. It does, unless you do your research like George did. Uh, this is not a, a, a black eye for GAFCON. Uh, this is certainly a black eye for the leadership in Kenya. Mm -hmm. But if people recall coming up to the Lambeth, there was a fraction of people who from Kenya were still going to go to Lambeth. And uh, one of those persons was a person who forged the signature of the Archbishop of Kenya. And that's all related to this story, George. A few years ago, we did a story where Kevin and I had an, uh, a telephone interview with Eliud Wabakula. Mm -hmm. Eliud was the Archbishop of Kenya at the time. And the fourth, the Anglican Consultative Council was to hold a meeting in Lusaka, Zambia. Eliud said that Kenya would not send a deputation. Then he went out into the bush, did some visitations in some remote diocese in the north near the Somali border. While he was gone, the Bishop of Nairobi forged his signature on a letter to the church leaders saying, Eliud has changed his mind and now we can go. And so the Arch the Bishop of Nairobi went uh, to uh, to the Lusaka meeting. And while he was at the Lusaka meeting, he was named to the Anglican Consultative Council Standing Committee. So he got rewarded for his crimes. Now, we pointed this out, and uh, Josiah Daufaron, the head of the ACC, called Kevin and I liars and demonic, that uh, we were just peddling false news. And one of the wonders of technology is that Kevin records these things. <laughs> and so, who are you going to believe? The Archbishop of Nairobi, 
who has a has a subset. It, Kenya is not a unified church. There's a group that is tightly tied to Trinity Wall Street, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Church of England. And whenever they can, they try to make trouble. And so under Elliot Wabakula, they basically broke ranks and sent a false deputation to the ACC meeting in Lusaka. Fast forward. After the Sudanese, South Sudanese, uh, consecrated a woman bishop, Bishop Elizabeth, Gafgon primates got together and they said, we're not going to stop, more touring. You said you wouldn't do it. You you went ahead and did it, but you're retiring in two months, so you don't care anymore. But just don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the Kenyans and the Ugandans, especially the Ugandans, who are ready to appoint women bishops, because that's just their churchmanship and culture, they said, okay, we'll hold off. That was made statements by the primates that's held now we've had the anti gafcon faction in kenya pull a fast one because the woman was appointed an assistant or suffragan bishop she wasn't elected a diocesan bishop two different paths one goes through the house of bishops one gets ratified one's this and that the other is the local bishop appoints and then after the fact, has the National Church endorse and invite her to the House of Bishops. So now the woman appointed is a sound scholar. She's theologically conservative and orthodox. You can't, she's the second woman ordained in 1984 into the Anglican Church of Kenya. Mm -hmm. She's got a terrific track record. So not, we're not talking about her personally or the issue of women bishops. Rather, she is a pawn in the battle, the war between Gafcon and Welbyism. Welbyism and its allies, Trinity Wall Street and the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada, over control of the hearts and minds of the global south. So this was done as much, I believe, to embarrass the primate uh, Jackson Olisapid of Kenya as it was to advance the issue of women bishops. Oh, absolutely agree. I mean, if you look at the last uh, Grant uh, press release from Trinity to Wall Street, uh, Tanzania, 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 uh, Uganda a little bit, uh, but Kenya as well. They 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 got money to give, and that money is to not just promote programs within the country, but it's to promote a, a little bit of I like you, you like me. Gafcon's not giving you all this money. You know where the money's coming from, right? And uh, that has worked, uh, sadly, in uh, places in East and West Africa to divide Gafcon. Uh, Tanzania, I don't know if it, you know it's coming back to Gafcon anytime soon. Uh, Kenya, they're working to divide. They're doing a great job uh, with something like this. I think you know Gafcon is clearly wiser and wise to how this happened, and it's not really a black eye to Gafcon. But and now the, the issue people will say, well, can the archbishop just say no and just stop it? No. Theoretically, he could, no. but you have to look at what's happening in Kenya right now. Mm -hmm. the, we've got national elections with a deeply divided country, just as divided as the United States between Democrats and Republicans. You have uh, two, two camps in Kenya that are just as divided, and there are also tribal issues here. And... The, the Archbishop of Kenya has to make the decision, okay, is this the ditch I'm going to die in? Or am I going to try to hold the church together so that we have a unified voice in the national elections? Am I going to, in other words, he has to pick his battles. This battle was thrust upon him. And I don't think that there, I don't think he really wants to fight this battle because after all, she's not a diocesan bishop. And, you know, you can make the excuses and people will you know people will say all sorts of things pro and con and they'll sort of forget that these things do not happen in a vacuum they happen in the context of political gamesmanship and battles my take is that the Afghan primates will appreciate the position jackson Oli sapit's in jackson Oli sapit has said he's not going to he wasn't going to lambeth 2020 when it was scheduled for 2020. Mm -hmm. Some of his bishops 
said, we're gone and we don't care what you say. Now, Jackson only Sapphic could have said, if you go, that's the dish we're going to die in. But could he deliver on his threats to discipline? Did he want to see if that would work? And that so is actually, that's, he, that's Lambeth, Lambeth endorsed schism. You know, that, mm -hmm. that you can come here to Lambeth and we'll help pay the way. We don't care what your archbishop says. We would rather you hear than be obedient to your church. And, you know, the Welby's See, so big message... Did... Go ahead. Well, and they're goodies given out by the Archbishop of Canterbury mm -hmm. for playing on his side that other people can't get. Uh, for instance, the Archbishop of Nairobi uh, when the uh, Roman Catholic Church had the Synod on the Family a year or two ago in Rome, the Anglican Church has always invited to send an observer. And who was sent? The Bishop of Nairobi. And it was actually pretty sad because you see him standing there in his uh, suit with the purple shirt. And, you know, you know he's a bishop, but he's not a Catholic bishop. And he basically, poor man, is lost. He doesn't speak Italian. And... <laughs> Uh, but it was a fun trip for him and something that makes, yes, I'm the official envoy of the Anglican world to this synod on the family. I can't understand the proceedings as they're going on. Uh, you, you know where I'm going. Well, sure. You yeah, get, it's a reward. You get, yeah. It's a reward. You know, in other words, schism. the uh, Bernard Natatori uh, played ball, the Archbishop of Burundi, and he gets kicked upstairs when he retires to the Anglican Center in Rome. He blots his copybook with sexual harassment allegations. And so er, uh, Ian Ernest, the Archbishop of the Indian Ocean, is gets, who's about to retire, gets kicked upstairs uh, to the Anglican Center in Rome. It doesn't do anything, but you live in a beautiful palazzo in Rome. You get to go to all these meetings with an expense account. And it, you know, if you like that sort of thing, it, they're rewards. You get appointed to committees. You get to fly to London to sit for six hours at a meeting. And then you've got the rest of the week your hotel paid for to do stuff, you know, on your own. So there's a really financial incentive not to rock the boat. Uh, and money's coming from the West yeah. to pay for these things. And it's a, I mean, we're not talking chunk change here. It's a, it's a lot of money. Uh, yeah. A hundred thousand dollars that Trinity can give to Tanzania goes a long, long way to pad pockets, and that's that's a reality that uh, Gafcon has to compete with. Uh, Gafcon's done really well, but how does Gafcon overcome uh, Trinity and Justin Welby's money and influence? I I don't know. We'll have to see. Hopefully, uh, the long game wins here, and uh, we shall see. Now, as we enter to the last and final story. Uh, we no, have... no, we, we got one more before we get what? to oh, the big one. Clearly, I forgot. Yeah, because... which, let me get my more coffee. Talk, we're, talk. we're going to move sideways from East Africa to West Africa. That's right. Go for it. And because we're going to continue the money talks. Uh, th there was an election on Friday uh, in the Church of the Province of, the, of West Africa. Some context for our viewers. Church of the Province of West Africa is the nation of Ghana with its 11 dioceses and then six other countries, seven other, six, five other countries with six dioceses, right. uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Cameroon, Liberia, the Gambia, and I'm missing somebody, uh, Guinea. Each of those, Sierra Leone has two dioceses, each are one diocese in the country. There are two internal provinces, West, one called West Africa and one they call Ghana. And each of those has an archbishop. Nigeria has 11 internal provinces and 11 archbishops and one primate. West Africa has two archbishops and one primate. The current primate, the, no, that's where we're. GAFCON is formed. West Africa is one of the founding provinces. Justice of Crofty, the Archbishop of Ghana, the Bishop of Ghana, and the Primate of West Africa is one of the founding GAFCON bishops. And Justice of Crofty, he's in the U.S. all the time. He's, at, you know, meeting with Bob Duncan. He's one of the players with Henry Arambi. He's really hot to trot. He retires. New Archbishop of Ghana is elected, Daniel Sarfo. 
Daniel Sarfo, Bishop of Kumasi, has ties to the Anglican Church of Canada, to the Church of England, to Trinity Wall Street. And he goes to Global South meetings. He says all the right things about, you know, what we believe and what we don't believe. But he pulls back from Gafka. And so West Africa is no longer a Gafcon province. Current Archbishop of Primate of West, in, of West Africa is the Bishop of Liberia. He retires in a year, and when that happens, the Archbishop of Ghana will get the nod because Ghana, with 11 dioceses, it's 80% of the people. Friday, Ghana elected an Archbishop, Cyril Ben Smith. His last name is Ben hyphen Smith. He's a bishop of a little diocese up country, Asante Apong, Among Apong, middle of nowhere. This new B bishop, Cyril, is a PhD from the UK, Nottingham, I believe. Um, he was an academic before he became a bishop, seminary dean, and he has very, and he's been on all these Canadian junkets where Canada will put together a, a junket for African bishops, usually from West Africa, Kenya, and Tanzania, and fly them all around the world to have meetings with their counterparts, and they'll agree to disagree, and the, but they get to fly first class to these meetings to agree to disagree and have great fun. And they get money from the Primates Fund for World Relief in Canada, from the Anglican Alliance in London. And so the new Archbishop of Ghana and the next Archbishop of the West Indi of West Africa, he may think all the right stuff, he may believe all the right things, but he is thoroughly tied into the money stream that supports his diocese in the middle of nowhere in the back and beyond in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're going to see a big shift in West Africa unless he has a come to Jesus moment. Which is not un not impossible. No, it's not. <laughs> you can have those things. It happens more often than you would know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just not at the international political level of the Anglican Church. So, hmm. all right. Well, so we now had one I, of those. Uh, I, go for it. it. You'd be surprised at how the Holy Spirit can work. I I've told this story so many times. People are thoroughly sick of it. But at 1998 Lambeth Conference, I saw. Uh, the Bishop of Long Island. Now, this is the Bishop of Long Island who was profiled in Playboy magazine, Penthouse magazine, for the gay sex parties that were taking place in his diocese with his wink, wink, nod, nod, who had been ordaining non celibate gay men and, and women to the clergy. This bishop, for Lambeth, 110. This bishop voted for the traditional church teaching on human sexuality. Uh, Jay Walker, Oris Walker, is his first name, nickname was Jay. Now, that could have been a pure act of the Holy Spirit, where he actually realized what had the line he'd been taken been wrong. Or he could have just been so befuddled he put his hand up at the wrong moment. <laughs> and, uh, and we have seen that as well. <laughs> Wait, what? what? Waiter, waiter. Oops. That's a, I didn't say yes. What? <laughs> no, you, you never know. And uh, as a reporter in the Anglican communion now for 10 years, maybe 15 years, you know, a long time. And as a Christian since I was 15, I've watched the Holy Spirit do just tremendous things within the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ uh, in the continuation and uh, movement of the church. It's been fun to watch and it's been so encouraging. Now we're going to talk about a hard I, story. Well, we, you know, I'm going to well, transition well, at some point to... <laughs> well, at some point, but I, I, I think this is a wonderful point because I watched yeah. uh, we had a last year we had a uh, revival meeting and one of the features was a layman. He was an Italian guy, um, Italian American. Mm -hmm. But he had actually, he had been, just got out of prison and he'd been in prison for seven, eight years. The man had been a soldier in the Gambino crime family. He was a mafiosa mm -hmm. who from his father was a mafiosa. And this man found Jesus and was 
basically repenting of his past life, doing everything he could to tell the world about a God who loved him so much that he, a killer, could be saved. So if, if mafia gunmen can come to Jesus and find redemption in Jesus Christ, even an Episcopal bishop can. Well, one of my favorite pictures from this year was Thanksgiving, and it was from a homeless shelter uh, just outside of L.A. And these people are going through the, the line, getting served by the people in line, and somebody with an iPhone or a picture just caught all these, you know, uh, probably 8 to 12-year-olds being served by Alice Cooper uh, in line at a homeless shelter in L.A. They have no idea who he is. Okay, no idea, and he's not there promoting him. He still says eye makeup, whatever. I, I think it's permanent or something. But there's Alice Cooper, uh, who's given his life to Christ uh, for at least a decade now, uh, serving uh, kids at a homeless shelter in L.A. You know, absolutely. Just one of the, the billions of examples of uh, God's works in the hearts of men. And uh, it's, as an observer, as a journalist, it's, it's an amazing to watch. Can I transition now, George? Yes. Well, I'd be really impressed if I saw Billy Idol oh, feeding right. people to a homeless shelter. <laughs> but you know, even God could do that. That's right. <laughs> Billy Idol. All right. So we, we have been accused again of uh, creating fake news, of uh, putting out a, a story which is clearly fake and where it's there to upset an election, upset a country. And I've not seen this much uh, pushback against the story since we, we covered the EMEA uh, some eight years ago. So I thought, you know, we want to... Many people are going to see this story for the first time right here in Anglican Inc. And unscripted. And we need to let well, you know... Saw, that, people saw it for the first time yeah, on Anglican well, Inc. They're going to hear We're about the it first for the first time. time. Yeah, but they're going to hear it for the first time, many of them, on Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> And as such, we just need to say it's a hard story. You know, when we cover uh, international news, uh, once in a while we're going to pick up leaders in the Anglican Communion who've done some really bad stuff, made some bad mistakes, or made some very bad life choices that we have to report on. And it sucks. Uh, this individual I know, met with him, talked with him, had dinner with him, lunch with him. Uh, uh, and many people know him. And I'm talking about Stanley Antigali of former Archbishop of Uganda. And uh, George, if you could please relate the story in a very journalistic tone, and we can talk about it. About uh, 10 days ago, uh, it's five days ago, five we days got ago. a, uh, Kevin got a tip from one of our uh, viewers who was closely tied into the Ugandan church, that a letter was being circulated within the Ugandan House of Bishops that stated that Archbishop, uh, the current primate, had disciplined Stanley Entegali. Stanley Entegali had admitted to having committed adultery with a married woman and who was not his wife. And that he was being, and that there were additional details of the story which we've not been able to confirm, so I'm just not gonna go there. Right, yeah. But the, but the, and so we said, okay, how can we confirm this? If we go to the public people that we know in, in Uganda, this will basically, this, you know, this can hurt them. So we just need to start. And so we start poking around, poking around, asking. We asked GAFCON, what did they know? We sort of walked ourselves around this story because all we had was this tip. Uh, then we were George we had this tip in the middle of the election in Uganda when they were shutting down the internet. The, yes, the, the government of Uganda shut down the internet in the country, not because George and Kevin were looking for dirt on the Archbishop <laughs> of Uganda, but because of uh, Facebook had decided, to, it's funny, Facebook uh, did in, in Uganda what it did in the United States. Except in the Uganda, the president of Uganda says, hey, you mess with me, I'm kicking you out, I'm shutting the whole thing down. <laughs> and so Uganda was without internet communications, just phone communications and fax. Remember faxes, Kevin? I do. And <laughs> so we, we started putting the story together. And then we got contacted by uh, one of the high, uh, higher-ups 
bishop levels in Gafcon saying, sit on this, if you would, and let the Ugandans announce it in their own way once the Internet's turned back on. And I hate to give away our trade secrets, but I, we had nothing that we could run with other than a rumor, so we couldn't do the story. So We, need, we needed a press release. <laughs> we got to be a peer magnanimous by saying, yes, on this one occasion, <laughs> we'll, we'll do what you ask, <laughs> even though we couldn't in good conscience go with what we had because it was just a rumor. Uh, non, it was a non-corroborated story. Yeah. See, folks, we corroborate our stories. <laughs> and well, so on Monday, the internet Monday morning, the internet comes back on, and at four a.m., I get the official communique from the Archbishop's office, Archbishop Kazimba, the text of the document. And later that day, around lunchtime, Archbishop Beach releases his statement from GAFCON. We publish the statements with no commentary, no background, but there's no need to, because the Ugandan church is basically, the Archbishop Kazimba was saying that, look, adultery is just as bad as homosexuality, and there's no excuse for what was done, and even though Stanley was a wonderful bishop, a great leader of our church, he's fallen short, and therefore he is suspended from the ministry indefinitely. And no, that means no the rest of his life. bishop is above reproach. You yeah. know, I, I, I was extremely impressed by the archbishop's statement. You know, so many times we see, you know, hemming and hawing, we see excuses. This is just matter of fact, go to Anglican.inc, read the... Uh, uh, press release for yourself. It, it's so nice to see, and we've talked about this many times within the ACNA, accountability. We're not going to have this play out in our uh, province. The GAFCON's like, we're not going to have this play out in our organization, and lo and behold, Church of Uganda, we're not, no, absolutely not. We're not going to hide it. We're going to address it. We're going to tell you about it, and we're going to hold this individual accountable. Hallelujah! You know, what would happen to the Anglican Communion and the Episcopal Church if they had done the same thing for the last 200 years? I know. <laughs> George is like, never. <laughs> oh, it's like saying, well, what if Hitler had won the war? You know, you just can't imagine a world it's like that. So it's just not... <laughs> no. But, the book, Kevin, you've made a very valid, impressive point that the culture in Africa is the big man can do no wrong. We broke this story a day and a half before the Ugandan secular press caught it. It's now on the radio in Kampala sure. and probably in tomorrow's newspapers. Mm -hmm. Now we put this out and on Facebook, on some of the African Facebook groups that we're members of, or where we distribute our news, the response was 80 rage. How dare you spread these fake lies about a wonderful man? I'm in Uganda right now, and I haven't heard word one. And how can you, a mezuzah, a white man uh, in America, know more about what's going on than me? Well, I'm a, we're journalists. <laughs> we ask questions. <laughs> well, but and it, it, so that there was a, a tremendous rush to say anybody saying anything bad about our archbishop retired is against God and an agent of Satan. Well, Justin Welby says that about us, but yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's the reality of how slow news can move in other environments. The Uganda press was, you know, just focused on the election. Just focus on who is is he getting reelected? Is there a new president? What's going on? There's a blackout. We we can't spread the news to the the world. Um, so they were just solely focused on the election. So it's not too surprising that this story took two, three, four days to get out into the Uganda press. Um, I'm glad that we were able to provide the story but, and provide context to it. But oof. But you know the Ugandans could have bottled this up. Uh, the Ugandan Church, Uganda, because you now you've got an election going on, so the Ugandan press isn't snooping around. Kevin and I are on the other side of the world, and we've just got phone contact with people over there, and we can't, you know, we do have standards, believe it or not, and we can't run with what we had. They could have sat on this, like the Church of England sits on uh, stuff. I'm thinking, remember, we did that Channel Islands story where yeah. they came out with a report that found the bishop was a horse's ass. And the, they had promised to release it. Well, 
we don't want the people to know the truth about the Bishop of Winchester, so we'll hide it. I mean, here's the thing. The Church of Uganda is more transparent than the Church of England, than the Episcopal Church. That they moved quickly, they were unequivocal in their condemnation, and they had no problem of basically taking one of their heroes and saying, you have clay feet and you must be accountable for either sin. That's a true church, not an institutional church or a dead church, and in my opinion. This should be a highlight, as sad as it is, for GAFCON. Accountability, a highlight for the Church of Uganda. It's a sad story, but we're having accountability because the church works. And, you know, I, I know you, you people well, look at this and, no, not, not Stanley. Well, it, it happened. We're going to have accountability. And we hope for repentance and uh, that he can re return to the life of the church. So, those are hard stories. Uh, do we want to talk about politics or we're already at 38 minutes, George? I, you know. no, oh, we do have that. We have breaking news from Canada. At that moment, eighty percent of our viewers shut what? off. What? Where's Canada? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, for a, well, just quickly, and we talked about this before. Um, a church that doesn't follow its own rules is leading the the, the path to destruction. It happened with the Episcopal Church. It's happening with the Anglican Communion. Um, you have canons, laws, doctrine, uh, prayer books for a reason to to help guide you through your daily. And, and generational understanding of the church and how you participate in it. When you don't follow those canons or don't follow the doctrine or don't understand the prayer book and, and have your daily office, things go haywire. I.e., example, Anglican uh, Church in Canada. And George, somebody from the wilderness says, okay, uh, can, I'm raising my hand here. We're doing it wrong. <laughs> Would you please, in your journalistic tone, tell them what I'm talking about? <laughs> Four or five years ago, uh, Canadian General Synod, gosh, it's been that long. Yeah, it's been uh, long Tried to change the prayer book and resolutions on same-sex marriage, uh, allowing it. Because the Canadian prayer book and the Canadian uh, church documents basically say marriage between a man and a woman, marriage. And the, the Chancellor of the Anglican Church of Canada pulled a really slick, sneaky job. He probably chases ambulances as a day job. But what he said was that, well, it doesn't define, it, it's silent as to the man and woman part. Because, you know, nobody would ever have thought that they could, you know, it, it doesn't say that cats and men can because it's silent therefore we can we shouldn't prohibit it because that's an argument from silence marriages of cats and dogs are not addressed by the canons and it's not addressed by the language therefore it must be allowable so we'll allow a local diocese to make the decision to marry cats and dogs well the anglican communion alliance which is a conservative group of clergy and lay people in the anglican church of canada you know, they fought this then, and they thought, you know, hey, this is just not right, this legal ruling. And they went and approached two, two canon law professors in England, uh, Mark Hill and Norman Doe, uh, who are not liberal, who are not conservatives by any stretch of the imagination. Hill, in 2009, you know, was pressing for the state to recognize same-sex unions and whatnot. These aren't rabid conservatives that people on the left would just dismiss out of hand. Certainly Norman Doe was in a conservative. They were asked to do a legal opinion of the chancellor's memorandum allowing dioceses in Canada to give a local option. And this was given back to the Anglican Community Alliance in October, who gave it to the Archbishop of Canada, Linda Nichols, in December, and then to all the Canadian bishops on Epiphany, January 5th. And what it said is that the legal professors, the real legal eagles, saying that the legal opinion upon which you have allowed local option on same-sex blessings is a travesty. It's a farce. It's, it, they call it, quote, disingenuous, which in a legal document means 
this guy is a real shyster who's lying through his teeth to basically let's the end and let's find a way to justify it and so we have a really harsh opinion not on same-sex marriage but on the way it was done and i think the problem is they're trying to bolt the darn barn door four or five years after the horse ran out yeah it's do you really think that any of these bishops who are pushing gay marriage, who are authorizing it, who have taken a stand, this is a matter of justice, do you think any of them are going to take one notice of the truth? No, I mean... Or of legal rationality? And that's the, the big question here. They don't care. They didn't care not then, five years ago, when they started uh, having same-sex blessings. Do you think all of a sudden they're going to care that they're doing it right now? Or that, you know, you know they, they just don't care. And I don't think you're going to see the canons in the church, uh, Anglican Church in Canada change. Because they're doing it. They're getting away with it. And nobody is complaining. I don't see anybody in the Church of England or Europe uh, raising their hand like they used to 10 or 15 years ago saying, don't do it. This is going to cause a, a tear in the fabric of the communion. Uh, the church is largely silent, and the Church of Canada is uh, benefiting from that. And they don't care that scholars now are looking at the papers and saying, we can do it better. So... It, it canon law now is in the same state as uh, traffic law. Um, nobody obeys it. Well, in Florida, I'm sure people in other states are law abiding. In Florida, the speed limit is 70. <laughs> if you go 70 on 995, you're, you're going to get tailgated and smashed, knocked off the side of the road. The speed limit's 80, 85, 90 until you see a state trooper on the rise ahead then it slows down to 75 or 80 but every or 80 and state troopers not going to pull out if you're going unless you're going over 80. um so the speed limits are only honored laws are only honored in breach it, it's like the rioting last summer it's illegal to riot unless you riot and do murder and damage and mayhem in cities where the prosecutor Portland or Seattle or Minneapolis where you got to get out a jail free card from the local district attorney that you can destroy and do mayhem and mischief and it's not illegal uh, right now rule of law means nothing no this used to be a nation of laws and we're finding that's uh, not so much anymore and that uh, it really depends on who the prosecutor is. If you have a yeah, the uh, yeah, the, the, the vice uh, president, the, the, the new what, vice president is a perfect example of a good slash bad prosecutor. Well, and also the uh, there's such a double standard. Uh, I don't like using political arguments uh, analogies, but. Uh, you know, all through the summer, Kamala Harris was saying, you know, was egging on the rioting. And in yeah. fact, she even was encouraged uh, it. Yeah. encouraging it as a justified expression of outrage and in donating money to bond, uh, out, to bail out uh, people, you know, arrested in these riots. Donald Trump may or may not, I don't want to get into that issue, but his critics accuse him of inciting violence uh, at the Capitol, and that's an impeachable offense. Well, Kamala Harris can actually be more uh, clear and unambiguous and do it over several times in several places, encouraging violence. And there's no question, there's no no thought that she'd even be brought to book on this. Well, so, I, the, 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 in other words, the rules for thee and not for me. I think the the new sin in this world is to question the election. Um, and we're finding the people, uh, senators and congressmen and business people who question the election, which uh, Hillary Clinton and her team did once uh, uh, Donald Trump was elected. They questioned it for months. How could this be? How could this be? Well, I'll, I'll say one word, Hillary. So, you, you know, questioning elections has been a time-honored process for the last uh, 220 years here. In, you said that long? Well, it's been a long time here in America. 
for the, the last uh, two centuries here in America, we've always questioned the elections. We always said, are we sure that the numbers are right and stuff like that? Now to question an election will get you to lose your job, to have you brought up on charges in Congress. Uh, they're going to bring Senator uh, Ted Cruz up on uh, charges and have him uh, taken out. Uh, you're not allowed to question what you see. And I, I don't want to What's discuss this? whether or not there was an election fraud. I just want to say, why can't we question it? What was it Dave Lindell? Uh, the My Pillow guy. Lindell yeah. is his last name. I, I forget his first name. Yeah. Uh, it was announced today Coles at Bed Bath and Beyond will not carry the My Pillow product line anymore because of his political activity. Well, folks, you remember Ben and Jerry of Ben and Jerry's ice cream? They've been way out on the left's, you know, far edge for. 25 30 years sure and i don't think of it you know the public's our big food chain down here is owned by a family it's a private corporation and they're very conservative politically do you think public markets ever thought of not stocking ben and jerry's ice cream because ben and jerry are vermont looney tunes no but you know coles and bed bath and beyond privately traded companies are taking political revenge on a uh an exuberant uh, pillow pillow manufacturer. So, I, you know, not to get into politics too much, but I, as a Christian, you know, am preparing myself uh, to a hostile government. In 2,000 years of Christianity, most Christians have faced a hostile government. This isn't new, but as, as Americans, we're going to have to prepare ourselves for it. And you do that first through prayer, scripture, I, as an Anglican, daily office, and encouraging the body. Uh, Hebrews 15 is very explicit. We gather together to encourage one another, and in the dark times coming up, the next two years, four years, 20 years, decade, century, we're here not to worry about the politics, but to love one another, grow the church, and encourage one another in the love of Jesus Christ. I can't be more explicit in that we're not just sit here and mourn the politics of the day oh we lost well, life goes on what are you gonna do yeah george it's been another fun episode boy we went long i'm looking here it says 47 25 26 20. <laughs> it's gonna go forever yeah, but kevin adultery mayhem, mayhem murder death i mean come on what more can you want uh, uh all right well so I'm back in Florida, and we will record again on Friday. Hopefully the new water heater for the RV gets installed before then, so we can take hot showers again. Yay! Can you imagine being in a nice... Can I warm... plug? Can, can I plug? What's that? We're doing morning prayer and Compline now every day. Cool. Um, from the Chapel of Shepherd of the Hills. So, folks, if you want a little prayer break, it's 10 p.m. or in the middle of the night. You can put bring them up on uh, uh, replay. Well, come pray with me in our show notes. And you find those on YouTube. There's a link to George's uh, Facebook page and my Facebook page. If you're not friends yet, we would love to be your friend on Facebook. And then when George posts a new video, it appears on his Facebook feed. I know because I watch. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 641 of Anglican uh, Scripted. And if you're still watching now, you're the most patient viewer we have. Mm -hmm.